is the Get Published Radio Show. And here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has the answers because, well, he's made all the mistakes himself. On today's show, our topic is memoir. So if you're tempted to press the send button on that steamy diary of yours, this show's for you. I think memoirs are definitely about learning from your mistakes. I know I've made some huge ones. I just can't remember a lot of them. Well, now, is that because it was like morning after the party or you just plain refused to like cop to them? I'm going to go with both. College was an interesting time. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm not ready to publish mine, but I've certainly I've ghosted and I've edited some for people. And I I do have some opinions. Uh, Cheyenne, what do you think might motivate somebody to publish a memoir? I think people have a lot of different reasons for wanting to tell their story. Definitely difference in experience from just the normal everyday life. Some way their life is sort of outstanding. Or it could be maybe to leave a legacy behind. They want to tell how they made it so far and whatever their career is or maybe made it through some sort of tribulation. So I think it, it depends. Yes, I have seen the idea of life challenges and especially people who felt like they have some compelling lessons learned or maybe they made a spiritual discovery or they feel as though they came back from something. And, you know, in the show, often you as our millennial and uh, Tom, uh, who isn't here today, but as our senior uh, member, uh, the idea of being, say, semi-retired and finally wanting to get something off your chest. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a, a very strong motivation, you know, among, you know, his and my generation. I think for you guys that are maybe just out of school or maybe you've just bounced back from the first job that you hate or, (laughs) you know, that there may be the anecdote, the short story, the, I used to call it peeing on your own shoes, you know, the the story of the drunken party and the failed pickup or the, the mistakes, again, the lessons learned, the mistakes that you made as a first time return to your sorority plans. Yeah, I think memoirs can definitely, in certain ways, bleed into the category of (laughs) self-help, kind of helping people to avoid mistakes maybe you've made in your life. Well, or Or, confession, if you're not a Catholic. You've got to have have another means of getting it out there. Like you said, getting stuff off your chest. Exactly. (laughs) Get it off your chest. And actually, that leads me to the point, I think there's another generalization I can make about looking at people's manuscripts that they say, this is what I want to publish, Mm -hmm. is very often they've got this desire to express. They they know that they've got a story. They know they've got something in their gut. They've been, maybe they've been chomping on it for decades, okay? And maybe people have told them, you know, you should write that. Well, the thing is that very often they may think that they're going to write a novel, but in fact, the novel comes across as a first-person memoir. In other words, they really can't get too far. The rock isn't falling too far, you know, from them. I think that their main character is almost always themselves. And and even among famous novelists, I mean, you've got Philip Roth, you know, people like that, who their first novel was something that goodbye Columbus yeah. out of their life. I mean, it's easiest, obviously, for people to write about themselves because they have all of their personal experiences to draw upon. But that could possibly come from a place of thinking, my story the way it actually happened isn't good enough or it's not interesting enough or whatever they feel would keep them from really writing a true memoir and kind of then flipping it into a fictional version of their lives. (laughs) And and that's something that happens in like screenwriting uh, groups in Hollywood. We talk about this all the time. The show isn't uh, a lot about Hollywood because we don't want to really open that door. (laughs) But one of the things about Hollywood is a studio executive will tell you if we buy the rights to the book, the only thing really committed to is the title. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, it's just an excuse to tell a story. We want, the expression they use is we want to take the audience on the ride they want to go on. Yeah. So if we have to, if we have to change the king's sexual persuasion, or if we have, so so we can team him up with a star, or we have to rewrite history, we'll do it to make a good story. But of course, if you're going to come across and represent this to the public as a memoir. That's where it gets tricky. It's not fiction, isn't it? So we go back to your journalism 101 training of how can I make this 
colorful, engaging, but it actually has to kind of be the truth, or else I'm going to call it a nonfiction novel. Now, yeah. nonfiction novel, we're right there on the borderline, right? Yeah, I mean, you can get into a lot of liability issues if you're using someone's likeness well, in, in amen. that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you say, well, it's my story. I'm giving myself permission, and my parents are gone, and I don't speak to my cousins. And the problem is, if you even as a relatively minor character, if you're talking about your next door neighbor, okay, yes, yes, you change the name. Problem is, if that character, and we're not lawyers, but we play one, <laughs> we play those on TV, right? <laughs> Sometimes, if if you, or we reserve the, we express the reserve the right to play one on TV. <laughs> the if that neighbor can recognize themselves. In, even in disguised form, and their neighbors, your friends, can recognize them, yes, yeah. you have got a big problem. Now, stories that I've adapted from life stories for movies, for, let's say, a cable movie, they get away with the key is when you see based on a true story versus inspired by a true story. Huge difference. A huge yeah. difference. And very often, they will let you know that in their disclaimer that Yes, it's been based on facts, but we made everything up. Yeah, okay, the characters which, which is actually are not, not real true. people. They're not meant to represent. They right. have that and, little and so like what you you said, do, disclaimer for sure to what, kind of get them off the hook if someone does come forward and say, hey, that's me, and I don't like the way exactly. that you played me. And so what you do, or what's done every day in Hollywood to get things through Studio Legal is not only do you change the name, but you may change the sex the mm-hmm. ethnicity, mm-hmm. the age, the mannerisms. If they're you know, Chinese, suddenly you give them a Southern American accent instead. Yeah. And, if the and, more distance you put exactly. between the real person and the character, the less likely you are to have to and deal with that And dramatically, okay, an trouble. opponent is an opponent. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't and, matter what they look like. And yeah. usually the characters that are unflattering are, of course, in your story, they're opponents. They're people that you're struggling against. So, you know, I think we're really starting to mind this. When we come back from the break, I think we want to talk about not only the idea of adaptation, but I think we also want to talk about, again, this whole idea of fact-checking and self-expression and even fake news. So we'll be back right after this. You know, Runkey Productions, the audio magicians can take your radio shows, podcasts, audiobooks, and ads from the streets of New York to the outer reaches of the galaxy. I think we need more echo at the end of that. Now look, visit us at R-U-N-K-E-E Productions.com. I still think we need more cowbell. GetPublishedRadio.com is your portal to a wealth of resources for realizing your fondest dreams of self-expression. On our four authors pages, you'll find a directory of editors and support services. You'll also find links just for publishers and for promoters. And if you want our help with any part of it, you'll find a request for services form. It's all there. What are you waiting for? At GetPublishedRadio.com. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. The topic of today's show is memoir, and I've been talking with my razor-sharp co-host, Cheyenne Cockrell, about the difference between adapting a real story and just making stuff up, which, you know, I think... um, Uh, motivation for a memoir might be to express a story, but maybe what's in you is a short story and not, you know, your own thing. But Cheyenne, let me ask you, from the standpoint of someone who's got a manuscript to develop or a project at whatever stage, maybe you could weigh in on the difference between developmental editing and ghostwriting? Yeah, I mean, developmental editing, I feel like, is for someone who has a very, at least in their mind, a clearer idea about what they want. They're going to do most of the work and have someone kind of help fill in the gaps where they fall short and kind of guide them through the process. You know, talk it into a recorder or right, or, yeah. or be interviewed and have it transcribed. Yeah, so someone kind of works for you, but you're kind of doing most of the work, whereas a ghostwriter is going to come in and just really get a lot more done 
done for you. Just essentially take your story and put it in their words. Yeah. I don't think it's either or, of course. You may start out, I mean, the times that I've started out thinking that I've got a developmental editing assignment, I may get in there and I find that there's actually huge chunks that have to yeah. be, you know, written, you know, written from scratch and, and with then approved by or vetted by, um, you know, the author or the subject. Um, but But often I think also, and I find this in nonfiction writing, and I'm, I'm wondering whether this has occurred to you as a journalist, uh, at, like in writing s- news stories, when I'm doing expository writing, and I'm explaining, let's say, a technical process, and I've got the basis of the article from a subject matter expert. I've got it from, you know, somebody who really knows their stuff. The problem is I'm going to come across information gaps where they talk about step one and they talk about step two, but it isn't obvious how they got from here to there. And so to be complete and to be thorough and for the reader to kind of keep up with you, it could be that everybody who's a rocket scientist knows how to get from step one to step two. Okay, it goes without saying, literally. If you're writing to a general audience or you're writing to a customer who they want to use it, but they don't, they're don't, they not capable of inventing it, mm-hmm. if you don't understand it and there's nobody there to tell you and you're on a deadline, you basically make stuff up. Now, that's <laughs> not... That's not to say that you're distorting or creating alternative facts, but what I say to my the people who are going to review it is, read me carefully, fact check in your own mind whether, if you haven't seen this before, is it true? Did I get it right? Okay. Or did I maybe misinterpret it? I think as long as you're taking that step to then, you know, even if you write it and then fact check it after, then it's okay. As long as you're not just, you know, sending it to print (laughs) with your like, I think this is right. But you know, the problem is, and not to brag is when I do when I make that stuff up it sounds so good they go I didn't know that <laughs> yeah you definitely want to make sure what you're putting in is factual but in a way for your readers to really be able to comprehend it especially with something like a technical process you want to make sure you have the correct steps there but like you said yeah if you have that gap of information you're going to need someone that's in that field to give you kind of layman's term version to help your readers really be able to comprehend what's happening. And, and we may think, our listeners may think at this point, we've really gotten far afield from memoir. Oh, no, but actually, no. I want to relate that a little bit more strongly because another pitfall that I've seen with manuscripts that come in from people who are intending to write memoir, I'll give you an example. A woman came to me who is a an artistic instructor, okay? She inst- instructs, and in, I won't say in partic- what part of the arts, but she said, here's my memoir. Well, as I read it, I saw that it was two books jammed together. Mm. It was her autobiography where she was talking about her career as a star, as a performer, the rocky road, you know, (laughs) how she got her way to the top, you know, as a discriminated against, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But embedded in this was an instructional course in how to do what her technique was. Yeah, I would definitely, I mean, I think if, if I came across the same thing, recommend doing two separate books There are two that. books. You don't want to jam that together because then you really lose one over the other. Well, but the other thing is the listeners who, or the readers, who want to buy a how-to book do not want to yeah. listen to you gas about what a great star you definitely are. Definitely a different they, audience, yes. They may, they may want some concise statements of, you know, I tried this, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I don't need a chapter describing the performance where I went on stage and I tripped over my, you know, whatever, all that. That's interesting for a biography. But when I see, a, when I think of a self-help book, when I think of how to, I'm actually thinking of those books with the numbered steps and the diagrams and the call outs. Because that book is not going to be read from cover to cover. No. They're going to go to the chapter that they need at the time. Yeah, it's not going to be... It's a manual. As effect. cohesive, yeah. <laughs> like like a help system page, mm-hmm. okay? And that's... Actually, that's the thing that eliminated computer books was really good interactive help systems. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was a part of that. But, but then also, Cheyenne, how about pain and suffering? I mean, it seems like memoir 
often wants to go there. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's where you get the kind of dichotomy of do people want to read about someone's success in life or do people want to read about people's downfalls? I mean, it. I think you can learn from both. And are you willing to explore that? As an author, are you willing to go right. there? Are you, re- are you ready to go to those dark places within yourself when you've been at your lowest times? Because that, I think, is so important, especially in kind of like the lesson learned type memoir, for the reader to really be able to identify with the author, knowing that, you know, the author was in this just low, low, low point in their lives and not thinking, you know, this person was just kind of a success from the start. Just the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The The challenge? Yeah, but just the connection that the reader and the author make at that point. uh, Empathetic uh, vibe, the engagement, which of course, engagement is what we what we seek on social media. But, you know, when we come back from the break, there is a, actually one anecdote about something that happened to me that I want to share with you because I do think that this idea of pain and suffering and where you go in your soul when you write is really important. So we'll be back right after this. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of the art history novel Bonfire of the Vanderbilts. The first book in his new mystery series is Preacher Finds a Corpse. He's also the host of Get Published Radio. Find help for self-published authors and free podcasts at getpublishedradio.com. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. So, Gerald, before the break, you said you had a nice little anecdote about suffering. You want to lay that on us? Well, I don't know about how nice and (laughs) about suffering, but I had this writing coach, okay, and I've had a bunch, but this uh, particularly expensive writing coach, whom I won't name, and I had asked him, I had written nonfiction for years and years, business and computer books. I was real familiar with that, and I was used to writing to outlines. I was used to writing sample chapters, proposals, marketing analyses. And so I asked him, I said, my fiction, I'm having more difficulty, and I'd written a couple of fiction, but I'm having more difficulty marketing my fiction or really understanding the process. And he said, well, Gerald, you really, you just don't understand your audience. If you knew who your audience was and what kind of characters they wanted to see, you just give it to them. In the business world, you know what that is. And so he told me to do a survey of my fans that I could reach and, you know, my peers and ask shamelessly, you know, what do you think? And the odd thing was I found out that his advice in that instance was 180 degrees wrong. Because when I started thinking about it, I realized in the creative area, fiction, creative, who might be models, Mozart. Picasso, Wagner, these were tormented souls. These were not people who cared a whit about what their audience thought. Okay, I mean, moats are totally crazy. Okay, they just made bipolar personality. Well, yeah. what I finally got to was they had the courage to go deep. They were so self obsessed, so egocentric. Picasso, oh my God, <laughs> that they were only focused on their own feelings and emotions, and they went places that other people are afraid to go. And that in itself is incredibly difficult, but you're not going to even begin to go there if you don't realize it's necessary. I think that's a great point. Like you said, if they weren't so narcissistic, they wouldn't have gone that deep. Well, in an informed memoir, good, yeah. if you, you know, and we've had coaches advise us, don't narrate, story tell, scene set. And I think that's fine. But then again, spoken word, things like that are kind of narrative. They're kind of the grandpa telling you how it was. And if I think if you're narrating in a proper way, you are setting the scene and storytelling. It just might not have the same amount of, you know, dialogue or interaction between characters, but you are still bringing the reader into that moment when yeah, you are narrating. there's a scene and there are episodes within your story. And uh, But I don't think that the hard distinction between, you know, show, don't tell, that is kind of a movie distinction. Yeah. And it's true that audiences are oriented that way, I think that the spectrum is broader than that. At least I would hope that there is experimentation a lot of different ways. No one correct way to write a book, obviously. Well, you There's know, so many different... tell Homer, yeah. okay? <laughs> I mean, that was all oral. You know, there was a lot of narration there. Yeah. And the Greeks did this, and they went there, and but but then again, he does talk about uh, the uh, you know the arguments that the uh, troops would have among themselves, and and mm-hmm. the, the the fearsome monsters that they would react to, and and all like that. So yeah, I think it has a you know healthy mix of both, and that's kind of what's important to keep 
keep in mind, you don't want it to be just completely you, you know, telling the readers what's going on and never really bring bringing them in, into a scene. It's an art and it has no rules. Yeah. It, like I said, there's no one right way to do it. So if we leave you with really anything, <laughs> that should be it. Yeah. You have to you have to play with it. You have to find what makes your story unique or interesting. Hopefully it resonates with people. We had some input also from coaches telling us about people wanting to express and wanting to be wanting to kind of just tell it tell it like it was. Mm-hmm. You know, nar- narration. The idea of and I think it was uh, uh, the screenwriter coach uh, Robert McKee said that a scene is it starts with a disagreement about an action and ends with a uh, an argument about values. Hmm. And I don't think all scenes are necessarily that, but I think if you write scenes that way, you won't go too far wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of goes into the ter- territory we were talking about earlier, where at what point do you realize, all right, I'm going to need to embellish this a little more? When do you want to go into the territory of fiction versus nonfiction? So just being able to figure out, is your uh, is your conflict or whatever the core of your story is enough, <laughs> I guess? Well, fictionalized nonfiction, yeah. yes. And, and it's the question of plausibility, mm-hmm. reality. Um, what they, in the old-fashioned term, was verisimilitude. Would a reader buy into the world that you're creating? Yeah. And w- that was one of the things we were talking about with war memoir, is that the detail, the smells, the sights, the different terrain, the, the culture of the people, all that, If to the extent that you can bring that detail up, it takes the reader someplace that they couldn't possibly go. It's the devil's in the details, as they like to say. Yeah, It creates a whole new experience for the reader if you're able to touch on every sense that they have. Even if they're just reading words on a paper, if they're able to understand, like you said, the smells and the sights and the touch of wherever the author is trying to take them, it brings the book to a whole new level. And we're flirting with that devil every day. (laughs) And that's our show. You know, Get Published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas. Even though we're deluged with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means... Please get published. The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Our producer is Lori Marple and your announcer is Bill Navarro. Music by Jason Shaw. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com. And thanks for listening.